Good. It's great to be back in Israel. I, uh, I was actually here at Technion last summer uh, when the International Space University was here. So uh, the hospitality was really great. And I appreciate being back. But what I'd like to do is, is talk to you a little bit today about uh, two things. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the first one is the, is the breakthrough prizes. Uh, and uh, this is how I got involved with this, with this association. Uh, about six years ago, uh, Vanity Fair, which usually doesn't come and talk to NASA, uh, came and talked to me as the director of NASA Ames and said uh, there were some uh, billionaires that were giving out the biggest prizes in science. And uh, they wanted to have a really nice ceremony, and they wanted to do it in Silicon Valley. And they uh, wanted to have it on the NASA Ames Research Center campus. Uh, you know, I, I looked up the billionaires, and they were pretty famous. People like Mark Zuckerberg, Richard Milner, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, and Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba. So I said, well, they certainly have the money. Uh, the, uh, so we ended up uh, uh, making an agreement, leasing them old 1930s airship hangars that are, if you come to Silicon Valley, you drive down 101, you can see these large hangars. Uh, the nice thing about it is that landlord, I got invited to the party. Uh, those of you who don't know, Andy Fair does the Oscar party, and it's sort of quite an impressive affair. Uh, but at any rate, I got to know the, the sponsors, particularly Yuri Milner, and I'll talk a little bit about some of his visions. Uh, the ceremony, of course, is, is the, 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 that Big structure there is Hangar One, built in 1933. Uh, this is a pretty fancy ceremony. It's, a, like I said, the only black tie affair in Silicon Valley. Uh, the uh, uh, this year we had it hosted by God. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's a pretty impressive, pretty impressive ceremony. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't resist calling him God when I met him. So he smiled. It's always good when God smiles on you. Uh, but uh, uh, the, I'll tell you a little bit about these prizes because one of the reasons I'm here in Israel is to encourage nominations of uh, some of these prizes. Uh, you know, we've been in existence for, uh, for uh, eight years. Uh, and as I'll tell you in a minute, these are the biggest prizes in science. The, the main prizes are three million US dollars. It's, Three times some small prize they give in Sweden. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but uh, uh, the ceremony is pretty fancy. Uh, uh, this is this is uh, uh, Dr. Hobbs who won the prize in the middle, uh, along with some young kid who runs some big company in here, uh, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, I remember it was that. Uh, but so the prizes are awarded usually by one of the Silicon Valley. Uh, high net worth people and, and, uh, and, a, and a movie star. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the prizes. The, there is a, a prize uh, in, in physics, so I hope some of the people in the audience will nominate your colleagues. Uh, the prizes are nomination, nominated as an open online nomination, uh, opens in March, closes the end of May. Uh, the, uh, uh, it can be split. Uh, by a number of winners. I think this year we, had, we gave the prize to uh, a black hole research and split it to uh, three people. But we also give out special prizes from time to time. Uh, this year we also gave out a $3 million prize to the gravitational wave uh, discoverers. Uh, the three principals split the, about half the prize. The rest of it, the uh, whole rest of the team got. So uh, people got something like $2,000 checks. Uh, the Technion just announced. Yeah. The same three, yep. and they're adding their wonders about traveling here for uh, much less money than we have. So, well, <laughs> there's too much money in Silicon Valley, don't call me. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, there's also another prize, there's a, a New Horizons prize for junior researchers. Uh, we haven't specified what junior means, it generally means. Uh, within 10 or 12 years of PhD, although for experimental physics projects, understanding some of these can take a good long time. Uh, uh, these are uh, these are hundred thousand dollar prizes. Uh, uh, there have been several junior prize or, or, or new horizon prizes that uh, later won the breakthrough prize. Uh, 
three years ago we started a mathematics prize. Uh, this also has been a rising uh, prize and it was up to three per year. Uh, life sciences, there are five life sciences prizes. Uh, and these are one prize, uh, these are not split. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of them is usually given in, in uh, Parkinson's disease and neurogenic degenerative disorders, but also some in, uh, in cancer research. There's a lot of good cancer research here, so I, I hope there'll be some nominations in that. Um, and, and, I, and I don't want to go over a lot of details, but uh, they'll be open in, in, in March. Uh, the, uh, uh, and anybody here can nominate, including students. So, uh, you know, I, I urge people to nominate, just you can't nominate yourself. Uh, and it's a fairly simple online nomination. The, the, the selection committee is the previous winners. Uh, so the, uh, uh, you know who the people are on it. But again, it's not like that Swedish prize. You don't know who's sitting next to it. Uh, another thing is if you know high school students, <coughs> Uh, I would urge them to submit for the, the Breakthrough Junior Challenge, uh, sponsored by uh, uh, Mark Tuckerberg and his, his wife, Priscilla Chan, and uh, Yuri Milner. Uh, this is a kind of a cool thing that started it uh, two years ago. It's a, a five minute video uh, on some principle of science. Uh, the, uh, the student gets a $250,000 scholarship, good anywhere in the world. Uh, the favorite teacher gets fifty thousand dollars. This is kind of cool, cool thing if you want. To. Uh, in fact, the first year the student didn't tell the teacher that he nominated, him. and so we called the teacher and said, "Where do we send your check?" And he says, "Is this a call from Nigeria? Uh, <laughs> you want my bank account for what?" <laughs> but we finally persuaded him, uh, and they're, they're, the young people are invited to the prize ceremony. It's a pretty cool thing. The first year was Ryan Chester. Uh, you can look at. Right through the Junior Challenge website, and we'll see a video and talk about uh, special relativity. Uh, and this last year, we split the program, we gave two prizes out to uh, the uh, one in uh, biological sciences, Diana C. from Singapore. The other one was uh, a discussion about physics, uh, uh, Antonella Massini from Peru. Uh, this is really a global prize, so we're, hopefully, there'll be some entries from Israel that, that win this next year. It's a pretty cool thing. Uh, let me now turn to the, the, the main topic that I want to discuss here with you today, uh, and this is the, uh, the breakthrough initiatives. Uh, the main reason that I left NASA, uh, in addition to the rumors that I was about to be fired every few weeks, <laughs> uh, which were true by the way, uh, the, uh, uh, was that, uh, as I said, uh, as the landlord I was invited to the party, and I got to know uh, particularly Yuri Milner. Uh, he uh, was uh, born in Russia, studying uh, for his PhD in theoretical physics. Uh, he left uh, physics to become an entrepreneur and quite a successful one. Uh, one of his most famous investments was the first big foreign investment in this little company called Facebook. Uh, he now lives in the US. Uh, he is an Israeli citizen. So he has a particular affection for, for this country. Uh, uh, but uh, after meeting him and having discussions with him, uh, uh, he has an abiding dream in sponsoring the questions of, of, of uh, uh, exploring all the aspects of life in the universe. And, uh, and so I'll talk mostly about, uh, about what he wanted to do. Uh, let, let, let me, and, and I'm, uh, I'm sure there'll be some biologists here, so I'll probably get this wrong. Uh, but. Uh, as a physicist, or actually an astronomer, uh, that I, I sort of learned there's kind of two kinds of cells on the planet. Uh, there's uh, pretty simple ones, uh, well, they're not that simple, but uh, that, uh, that have a, a simplified structure called prokaryotes. Uh, <coughs> these have a relatively uh, compact uh, DNA uh, structure that, that is not encapsulated. It's uh, sort of free in the nucleus. Uh, and then there are eukaryotes, <coughs> which is what we are, uh, and uh, uh, these have a much more com uh, complex structure. Uh, the, the DNA, the nuclear DNA is encapsulated, uh, but they also have uh, uh, other 
DNA throughout the nucleus in the case of animal cells, they're, they're mitochondria. Uh, in the case of plant cells, they're chloroplasts. Now, the interesting thing about this, and the reason I raise it, is that uh, if we look at life on Earth, uh, essentially all life uh, can be divided into three classes. There are two classes of prokaryotes, uh, bacteria and archaea, that differ by fundamental chemistry of the cell coat. And then, there, as I said, there are eukaryotes that go from, from single-celled uh, organisms uh, all the way up to uh, uh, large multicellular organisms like humans and trees and so forth. Uh, now, this is the interesting thing about life in the universe. Uh, prokaryotes emerged on the Earth sometime in probably the first billion years, uh, maybe in the first 300 million years of the Earth's existence. Uh, the, uh, and it appears that both archaea and uh, bacteria emerged fairly early and possibly separately. Uh, but then sometime roughly a billion years ago, uh, this process, which is sort of theoretical, is that uh, bacteria were eating each other and uh, or absorbing them. Uh, and uh, uh, that at some point a symbiosis uh, occurred where uh, a, uh, or a archaea cell engulfed uh, one or more uh, bacteria and they formed a symbiosis. Uh, where ultimately the, the bacteria became mitochondria, which are energy producing uh, parts of the cell, which have separate DNA from the core. Uh, and then similarly, plants uh, uh, engulf perhaps cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic uh, bacteria cells and produce plants and animals. Now, there's a big argument about this, but this you know, might have occurred only once. It may be completely unique. Now, the reason I kind of go through this is uh, that this is, first of all, a very active area of research and pretty exciting. It's one of the key parts of what's known as astrobiology. Uh, so the key question is how life emerged on Earth. But it's relevant for life elsewhere. And uh, I kind of give three alternatives here. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is what really the questions we're trying to answer are. The first one is that, uh, that all life, uh, it's a singular event that, that it happened on the Earth and maybe nowhere else in the universe, or at least not very uh, frequent. Uh, in this case, any life uh, is uh, found anywhere else is sort of a significant uh, answer, and that we may actually be very alone. Uh, it could be the only life in the universe. Uh, we have no idea until we do some research whether it's true or not. The, the second is that maybe simple life is common, that uh, prokaryotic cells or something like that emerge everywhere. Uh, this is one of the really active parts of research in, uh, in our own solar system. Uh, uh, of course, we're looking for evidence of life on Mars, uh, which, if it exists, probably under the surface uh, in uh, aquifers that remain on that planet. Uh, people are interested in looking <laughs> oceans of some of the outer solar system moons, which we now understand a lot of them have deep oceans, like Europa, uh, the, uh, one of the large moons of Jupiter. Uh, Enceladus is a moon of Saturn that actually has, pretty clearly has water. In fact, some of the stresses caused by the gravitational stresses, the water is actually being jetted into space. Uh, so this may say that, okay, life is really common. Uh, on the other hand, that the event that produced uh, sophisticated life or intelligent life uh, was extremely rare. And so, in this case, we may also be very much alone. This is the second case we consider. Finally, is that, uh, that all of this life is common, or something like it, uh, and that intelligence uh, may be common. So this is really the third, the third question we're trying to, to, uh, uh, to explore. So let me start with the breakthrough initiatives, which are, there's now about five of them. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, the first one uh, was announced on uh, July 20th, uh, uh, 2015, uh, the anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, uh, pretty cool date. Uh, in London, uh, this is Gary Miller and the other guy I think you probably recognize, uh, who was uh, 
been a very good sponsor and, and uh, uh, innovator and uh, inspiration to us on this. Uh, uh, but uh, we announced uh, 100 million US dollars over the next 10 years to revitalize our search for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, this is a topic that at least scientifically was, it was really begun in the 1960s by uh, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan. Uh, the, uh, there was a lot of effort in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in fact, my former center uh, uh, started a major government program in the, in the early 1980s, which lasted for about a decade and a half until certain members of the U.S. Congress decided it was a waste of money. Uh, the, uh, don't, don't get me started about politicians. It's a bad time uh, to talk about politicians. I, I, I won't give away which side I think is right or wrong, or I will, they're all wrong. Uh, but uh, at, at any rate, this, is, uh, uh, this, this initiative was started uh, called Breakthrough Listen. Um, the first thing we did is, uh, and this is good news, good news and bad news, this is the world's largest steered radio antenna, it's 100 feet in <coughs> diameter in Green Bay, West Virginia. Uh, because of, of limitations on funding, uh, this and other large instruments around the world that might have been a few decades old are being uncovered in terms of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, financial support. So we were able to, to get 20% of the time on the Green Bank radio telescope. Uh, really you know, uh, good, good program, it's a, it's a fantastic instrument. Uh, we also uh, were able to get 25% of the time on the second largest radio telescope in the southern hemisphere, the 65 meter radio telescope in Parks, New South Wales, in Australia. Uh, this is an interesting instrument. Uh, this was actually the dish that received the Apollo 11 moon landing, uh, or, or, or moonwalk uh, data. Uh, if, if any of you have not seen the movie, there's a movie called The Dish, which is a quintessentially Australian movie. They were, it started with a play of cricket in the dish. Uh, so, uh, I did take a cricket ball and throw it around up there. Uh, if you buy 25% of the time, you can pull around a little bit. Uh, the other thing is, of course, these are radio telescopes. Uh, as we know from our current technology, increasingly uh, communications uh, in space, particularly, is by uh, optical means, by lasers. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, got 15% of the time on the automated planet finder at Blick Observatory. I will say it's not the big going there, that's the, uh, that's the 120 inch uh, look telescope, that's an atmospheric computation experiment. The, the automated planet finder is the, the, the small white dome, uh, kind of right in the middle. <coughs> but uh, uh, this is designed to do radio velocity research on uh, nearby stars to look for evidence of planets. We're also modify it so we can look for laser signals. So this is a, uh, a beginning on that. And then recently, uh, this telescope is the largest radio telescope in the world. It's the 500-meter uh, uh, radio telescope in China. Uh, we've signed an agreement with the, uh, the National Observatory of China to, to get roughly 15% of the time on this. So exciting efforts. So this uh, <coughs> we began uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we're putting as much of the data online as we can. Uh, our primary objectives are to observe uh, uh, a million nearest stars, uh, which, by the way, is an interesting number uh, to, to figure out uh, how far away are the million nearest stars. There have been about a thousand light years. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, that's a uh, when you ask when was the first evidence of of, of industrial activity on on our planet? It was about two thousand years ago. Uh, the, uh, Romans cut down all the trees in Spain to smelt silver and caused industrial pollutants in the atmosphere. So you said, well, if, if, that, if, if you had a technology maybe a little more advanced than ours, you could observe the atmospheric spectrum of our planet. Uh, a thousand years ago, you would have, would have discovered some industrial pollutants. So that means a thousand years out and a thousand years to send a signal back. Uh, so an interesting effort. We're also scanning the planet of the galaxy. Uh, we hope to put all of the raw data online in that one, one scan here. Uh, 
uh, we're looking at nearby galaxies. So it's a very exciting effort. Uh, been going about a year. We haven't found any intelligent signals yet. Uh, maybe that's going to work with you. And uh, I'm not a Stanford grad, but that's me. Uh, they're doing quite a good job. Uh, now, there's a more controversial effort that we announced we haven't done much with yet. It's called Breakthrough Message. Uh, the, uh, one of the questions is that uh, what do you find an intelligent signal? Do you answer it? Uh, and that's quite a controversial question. Uh, the, uh, Stephen Hawking is very much against answering anything or even sending any signals out. Uh, the, uh, I had certain members of the U.S. Congress tell me if I tried to send any signals, they'd shut us down. Uh, but on the other hand, we did get people to agree that, well, it's reasonable to think about sending signals out. Uh, so we will announce probably in the next six or eight months a prize uh, for two things. One is posing probably an image signal that best represents our species. Uh, and second is uh, there'll be some technical uh, competitions to figure out how to encrypt or encode the data so it's easy to be uh, decoded as well as how to transmit it. Uh, I, I might add that there have been signals sent out to, uh, this was the first signal that was put together by Frank Gray and Carl Sagan and broadcast from Arecibo. That was broadcast at a globular cluster 25,000 light years away. So we've got, you know, a bit of time to wait for a response. <laughs> years. So this is probably pretty safe. Uh, but this was sent out you know, as a very simple uh, computer signal. So we think probably do a lot better than that today. Uh, the really exciting thing from my perspective the uh, Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, we announced this uh, in New York City uh, on uh, April 12th, of, uh, 2016, uh, the 55th anniversary of humanity's first flight into space, uh, Yuri Gagarin's flight. Uh, I might add that Yuri Milner was named after Yuri Gagarin. Uh, and uh, I wasn't sure I believed him, but I asked his mother, and she said, yes, he was. He was born about five months after Yuri's flight. So, uh, you know, a, a significant inspiration. Uh, the objective here is to send a probe to the nearest, to the nearest star and do it within sort of a generation. Uh, of course, the, one of the questions is, you know, do we think there's anything interesting around the nearest star? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, one of the missions that I was honored to be able to have led at the NASA Ames Research Center was the Kepler mission. Uh, Kepler was, uh, was launched in uh, 2009. Uh, it was designed to look at very precise levels of light from uh, about 150,000 solar type stars. And, uh, what we were looking for is that, that if we expect some or maybe most of these to have planetary systems like our solar system, that statistically some of them would be edge on to our line of sight. And so as the planet went in front of the star, we would see a small decrease in line of shadow. Uh, this was a phenomenally successful mission. Uh, it basically proved that essentially every star in the galaxy has planets. Uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, way in the last century, in the middle of the last century, that was even longer ago, uh, we were told that maybe one in a thousand or one in ten thousand stars might have planets. And we now know that essentially all of them do, which raised our, our likelihood of finding uh, another Earth. Uh, we think at least a quarter of these have a planet that's sort of the size of the Earth. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, of course, now the question is, can we go there? The, uh, the, the, the human probe that's the furthest along is the Voyager probe. Uh, the, uh, the nearest star is about uh, 300,000 astronomical units away, or the astronomical units the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, this is about 130 astronomical units, so at its speed, we'll get there about 80,000 years if it was even aimed in the right direction. Uh, another program is unlikely to get funding. Uh, the, uh, so one of the key questions is, can we go faster? Uh, and how much faster do we need to go? Uh, the, uh, to get to the nearest star, you need to go at least 1,000 times faster than, than, uh, than Voyager uh, and the other satellites that we've launched. Uh, in fact, we need to go uh, a fraction of light speed. Uh, we, uh, we pick 20% uh, so we can get to the nearest star, which is 4.2 light years away, and sort of you know, 
20, 25 years. Uh, now, this doesn't sound all that hard. I mean, the last century we went on times faster from the beginning of the century to the space age. Uh, so the question is, how can we do it? Well, the standard way to do stuff in space is, is, uh, uh, is you burn material and exhaust it out the end of the rocket. And uh, of course, the rocket equation tells you what thrust you get. Uh, and you can, uh, you can kind of figure out that uh, you know, if you want to go something like you know, few <coughs> tens of percent light speed, uh, you need to get a, a specific impulse which characterizes the, 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 a rocket uh, of about a million. Now today, typical chemical rockets get about 300 to 400. Uh, there are electric propulsion systems that get maybe a few thousand, maybe up to 10,000. Uh, so if you look at using a chemical rocket, uh, you can calculate how much fuel you need to get to 20% of light speed. And, there's an argument that it's somewhere between a few solar masses and the mass of the galaxy. Uh, probably not going to fund that in your term. Uh, now, there are ideas for, for fission and fusion rockets that do start to get hundreds of thousands of specific impulse. Uh, so there have been designs for this, but like the whole question of fusion energy that uh, I was told about 40 years ago when I was interested as a graduate student in, in studying fusion, controlled fusion reactors, that the fusion energy was the energy source of the future, always has been, and always will be. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure we're going to get there. And we did look at this. Uh, of course, one of the very interesting ideas is that you get even more energy if you did a matter and a matter uh, uh, combination. You can get 5 to 10 million sometimes, specific impulse. Uh, and indeed, NASA did some studies that showed that you know, if you have enough antimatter, you can build an interstellar rocket. Uh, the trouble is that, that producing antimatter, uh, it is produced in particle accelerators today. Uh, I think the total amount of that were produced in the Fermi lab the accelerator was something like 10 to the 14th antiprotons over 10 years. Uh, in order to do something like this, you need about 12 orders of magnitude more. So we're probably not there yet either. Although I will say that there are, uh, these are a couple of former Livermore employees that uh, uh, have some ideas that actually got quite a bit of funding from Silicon Valley is that, that you can use uh, uh, anti-electrons, positrons, to uh, induce uh, uh, a fusion reaction. Uh, now I, I have to say that some people say this looks suspiciously like cold fusion, uh, but uh, they're good guys, so maybe it'll work. Uh, the, uh, now there's even more exotic stuff. This paper appeared a few months ago. Uh, uh, and this is magic, in my opinion. Uh, this was a paper that said that uh, you end up getting some sort of thrust out of somewhere uh, without any real physics. Uh, but I put it up here because this paper was published in a more or less referee journal. Uh, and I also put it up here because the Chinese claim this works. Uh, they, they claim they tested it in space, uh, but you know, I find it hard. I find it hard to understand how something works when physics is, it violates three or four laws of physics. So uh, I just put this up as to acknowledge that there are ideas that, that frankly, I think are rubbish, but you know, somebody needs to pay attention to. It. So what did we do? We said, well, let's go back to an old technology. Sailing, where you keep the, you know you either use as fuel uh, sort of an ambient medium, or or you you get it to, you keep the fuel at home, uh, sort of like a sailboat. Now this is an old idea. Uh, we did find that Kepler had written to Galileo, you know, talking about sailing in space using heavenly winds. Uh, we don't really know what he was thinking of, but we're going to assume it's what we're doing. Uh, but uh, the basic idea is a light sail that uh, uh, you use photon pressure. Uh, this has been tested a few times in space recently. Uh, uh, one by the Japanese, the Icarus probe. Uh, this is a, an experiment privately funded, done by uh, Planetary Foundation. Uh, now the problem with using solar radiation pressure is that uh, uh, sunlight's pretty dilute and it's kind of hard to get 
maybe you can get close to 1% light speed. Uh, but uh, uh, to get the speeds we want, this doesn't look like it's going to work. Uh, however, uh, and this is really a, a significant change in the last uh, five or 10 years, that there have been two trends that, that tell us that maybe we could use light sails to, to get us to, to these speeds of uh, our original <coughs> fraction of light speed. The first of those are the ability to make things much smaller, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what I mean by much smaller, uh, so that you can have a spacecraft that, that is roughly a gram or less. Uh, uh, and second, the ability to uh, gang lasers together to, to have an extremely uh, high power beam. A lot of this is being driven by the communications industry. I know there's a lot of research here. In fact, I'm anxious to, to see it because it's a lot of research. The, uh, so basically our idea is to have one humongous laser, technical term, uh, that we need about 50 to 100 gigawatts of power. Uh, this is a, a kilometer square array, and, and by the way, this is, the artist put this together, I don't know how many times we've tried to explain that optical telescopes don't look like radio telescopes. <laughs> But uh, they said it looked cooler. Um, but uh, this is a, a kilometer square. Uh, now, the, to make it a little easier, you only need to fire it once a day for a couple minutes. Uh, but it's still a formidable challenge. And Deacon, I think it's at the top of our list of how to build this big array and phase all these lasers and get the light through the atmosphere. Uh, by the way, the, the most likely place for this is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, the, when we made our announcement, the Chileans said, would you like to come and talk to us? Uh, so I did a few weeks ago. Uh, it was interesting. I got escorted in to see the president of Chile. Uh, she was actually quite interested in it. She just wanted us to make sure that we kept them in the loop. Uh, but uh, this, is a, this is an interesting concept. Uh, and as, as I noted, that you know, we're beginning to gang lasers together to do that. Uh, now, can, can we anticipate this would be reasonably affordable? Uh, what we're finding is in the last decade or so, the lasers, in terms of cost, uh, have decreased roughly on the sort of famous Moore's Law. Uh, and you could extrapolate the cost of what we want to do is, is maybe $10 billion in 15 or 20 years. Uh, so you know, we're hoping for a continuation there. Uh, also, the power of lasers has increased sort of roughly on a log linear manner. So there's some cause for optimism. Uh, in the last uh, year since we made this announcement, we've done a lot of work to, uh, and we think that, that this is a, a very feasible uh, possibility in the, in the next few decades. Now, the other thing is spacecraft. This is a standard spacecraft today. I think this is a communications spacecraft. <coughs> it weighs a thousand kilograms or so. Uh, one of the things that, that I was really excited about is about 15, 20 years ago, <coughs> the concept of CubeSat. <coughs> Up, which are done here, uh, that we have a one kilogram, uh, 10 centimeter square satellite that does most of what this does. Uh, indeed, that's come, come along quite well. Uh, but the question is can we take that to a chip? And uh, uh, in, in fact, you know, when we start looking at it, to, you know, if you have an Apple Watch, the chip in it does a lot of things the spacecraft does. And uh, so we think we can build. A spacecraft that is sub gram uh, uh, capability. Uh, I brought one with me. So I challenge people to bring a spacecraft with them. So this is a prototype that was put together by Mason Peck at Cornell University. Uh, I'll say some of the components are, are mock ups, but some of them are real. Uh, the, uh, so this is a, we, we think this is feasible. Uh, we have a sitting on the launch pad. And sitting for six months, that some of the precursors of this that, that weigh a few grams uh, will be the first launch of the hopefully chipsets that work. Uh, but uh, again, you know, the, if you look at uh, what this thing contains, uh, it has a, a couple lasers uh, on board that are uh, that are used for orientation. Uh, it has a a large laser like a watt that uh, can be used for communications, uh, <coughs> processors, storage. Uh, it's powered by a, a radioisotope battery uh, that's on the back of this. This one doesn't have real radioisotopes, I hope it doesn't. 
I have to go. So if I start kind of twitching a little bit, Professor Peck put something exciting in. Uh, but this, uh, this technology is coming along pretty well. Uh, as I said, we can go through and, and actually today find most of these components uh, that, you can, that you can buy. Uh, we did a uh, sort of a mass balance of this, and it seems to be pretty, uh, pretty reasonable to actually get sub-gram uh, spacecraft components. Uh, so the idea is to, is to attach to this about a four meter uh, diameter light sail. Uh, that is, by the way, a huge challenge is to get material that can take uh, 50 gigawatts for two minutes, accelerated at about 50,000 Gs, uh, and then survive in interstellar space, which is another big challenge. Uh, and then also we need to use the, the sail itself as an optical element, so these are pretty big challenges, but you would uh, have a mothership that would have hundreds of these things that would be in elliptical orbit. Uh, at about 60,000 kilometers, we would deploy one, the mothership would move away, because 15 gigawatts is a lot of power. Uh, you would then push the, the light sail uh, for about two minutes, after which point you're, you know, you're about to, uh, you know, several million kilometers out going 0.2 C. Uh, of course, we have to direct it in the right direction. Uh, but uh, this is our objective uh, in the next uh, couple of decades. Uh, for the next few years, uh, see it, see it yeah. stays on the but Sales, sales. Yeah, we need to use it as an optical element, uh, both as for imaging of the, as you fly by the planet and to direct the laser <coughs> back. The, 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 there are four really big challenges, and in fact, uh, we had about 25, but there are four that we think are really tough. The first one is building this laser that's, you know, that cost you know, a reasonable amount of money that's a kilometer square. It's a kilometer square telescope. Uh, that, roughly for 10 billion. Uh, second is building the sail on this that can take that much power. And, uh, by the way, we found some materials already that can do it, about a factor of 10 too heavy, but uh, they're, they're uh, sort of meta materials. Uh, the, the third challenge is communicating the signal back. Uh, one watt laser isn't very powerful. It's, it's not gonna be a full duty cycle. Uh, it, uh, and it, it turns out you can close the loop if you use the sail as a couple meter optical focusing element to focus it back on the Earth, and you use the transmitting array of the Earth. So these are, so the, the third one is communications. The fourth one, that I don't think we can do anything about, is interstellar media. We're gonna hit dust and things. So one of the questions, we can shield the critical components a little bit. We can, uh, we can perhaps distribute them around the sail. So that's a, that's a, a, a big issue. Uh, I, there's another issue I, I might add is policy. Uh, the amount of power you're putting in this chip is the equivalent to a small nuclear weapon. Uh, when you take something that's a gram and accelerate it to 0.2 C, it's got a lot of kinetic energy. Uh, so there's a question of firing this much power in space uh, so that we're gonna have to work on policy issues as well. Uh, at any rate, we've, we've put these online. And we've got a lot of comments. Uh, you know, we, we think they're hard, but uh, we're going to spend the next five years or so with 100 million uh, to begin doing a research and engineering program. Uh, we hope to announce uh, RFPs uh, within a couple months. Uh, one of the big issues, of course, as I mentioned, is policy. Is, is, is lasers are kind of critical technologies. Uh, they have military applications, so we have some export control issues. Uh, we do want to publish everything openly. That's another uh, critical issue. Uh, if this program is successful, uh, we think we can uh, build a subscale prototype that may be tens of meters diameter uh, for about uh, a billion. Uh, we think we can privately fund this uh, from some of our sponsors. Uh, and then this would uh, lay the foundations for a government, public-private partnership with many governments and the private sector to build, <coughs> to build the full beam director. Uh, I might add this has a lot of other potential to send things around the solar system, much bigger payloads, hundreds of kilometers a second. Uh, and by the way, and, and something I'm not gonna, you know, we're not gonna talk a lot about, but I'll just mention it, is that this laser is powerful enough to uh, divert asteroids that we find uh, potentially threatened. So this is something we think might be built. Now the question is where are we going? Uh, by the way, we have a pretty prestigious advisory committee. Uh, 
the nearest star is Alpha Centauri. Uh, I guess it's the, the International Astronomical Union said we're supposed to call it Rigo Centaurus now, uh, which was an ancient uh, name for it. Uh, it's in the southern hemisphere. In fact, you can go pretty far south to see it. It's about uh, minus 61 degrees south. Uh, it's an interesting star system. There's actually three stars system. Uh, there's two stars that are roughly solar type that orbit each other in about 70 years. There's a third very distant star. That, until recently, there was an argument of whether it's attached to the other two, but we don't think it is. It's a red dwarf star, so it's a, about a tenth the mass of the sun, and, you know, uh, you know, fraction of a percent of the luminosity, uh, called Proxima Centaurus. Indeed, it's it's far enough away, it wasn't recognized until the 19th century, it was actually maybe associated. Uh, as I said, there are, there are these three stars. Uh, one of them's a little bigger than the sun, one's a little smaller, uh, the main ones. Uh, the interesting thing about the star system is it seems it's slightly older than the sun. The sun is about four and a half billion years, maybe five billion years. So if there are planets there, they can be very interesting to see. Uh, the, uh, of course, we made this announcement before we knew there was anything in that system. Uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, and this was an announcement in August of, the, of this last year at the European Southern Observatory. Uh, they invited me, so it was kind of cool. Uh, but what they basically discovered is around Proxima Centauri, and they discovered this by not direct imaging, but by uh, reflex motion, the radio velocity of the star. They saw that it's moving around in a way that says it's a planet. The planet appears to be roughly Earth sized. Uh, it's also in what's called a habitable zone, which means liquid water can exist on the surface. Of course, we already have a picture of it, so we don't need to go there. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, this is the nearest, actually, it's of the three stars, it's slightly closer to, the, to us. So the very nearest star has a Earth sized planet, a habitable zone. Uh, of course, we don't know whether there's life there or not, and that's the subject of our latest initiative, which we haven't really entitled yet, but we may call it Breakthrough Watch. Uh, but uh, uh, we have just signed an agreement with the European Southern Observatory. Uh, we're in negotiations with other major observatories to modify the <coughs> current class of the world's largest telescopes. The, uh, the very large telescope, BLT. Uh, by the way, astronomers like to have pompous names. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll show you in a, the telescope they're building, which is called the Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, it was initially going to be the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the Very Large Telescope uh, is big enough that you can actually directly image, means we can see the planet directly around Alpha Centauri A and B. So we're looking uh, around those stars. Uh, this is the BLT, it's actually four eight meter diameter telescopes. Uh, the, uh, uh, for those of you with <coughs> astronomical instrumentation, there is an adaptive infrared secondary on one of them, uh, which means you can, you can remove some residual atmospheric perturbations. Uh, there is what's called a coronagraph, which enables you to see very faint things next to a very bright star uh, that uh, is on one of the other telescopes. We're modifying that to work to uh, get 10 microns in the infrared, which is the contrast between the planet and the star is at the maximum there. Uh, so if there are planets the size of the Earth around Alpha Centauri A and B, we will see them. Uh, of course, the question is we can't tell much about them until this is built. This is the EELT. European Extremely Large Telescope. There are two others of its class. This is 39 meters in diameter. Uh, when it was going to be the overwhelmingly large telescope, it was supposed to be 100 meters. Uh, but, but it's big enough that uh, we can actually get a spectrum of the planet around Proxima Centauri, and if we find them around Alpha Centauri A and B, uh, we can then look at uh, what the composition of the atmosphere is. Of course, the classical answer is we find oxygen and water. Uh, that will tell us there's a uh, uh, something very similar to the Earth that has life, that life is necessary, we think, to maintain a high level of oxygen in the atmosphere. Although experts of this say, you know, there wasn't much oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth for about three and a half to four billion years of its lifetime. So 
uh, you know, there's a big argument about what we found. Uh, but at any rate, the uh, you know the, the idea here is that uh, sometime in the next decade or so we may begin to answer some of these questions. Uh, we have an annual conference uh, held at Stanford University. Uh, this year we're going to focus on the um, Proxima B, the, the, the planet uh, that uh, appears to be orbiting Proxima Centauri. Uh, we're going to look at what you can do in the next decade or two with remote sensing, instruments like the EELT. We're going to figure out what we put in this chip to fly by, hopefully in a few decades. Uh, and then, uh, interestingly, you know, the, there's an Earth there, you know, there's a question, is, is there intelligence there? So we're going to figure out what we might look for evidence of intelligence. Probably extremely unlikely, but uh, this is, you know, as we start finding these things, we should look for them. Well, let me stop there. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. But, uh, that's a cool project. <laughs>
uh, and everybody told it was impossible then, but as technology got better and better, uh, then they were able to do it finally. So uh, our, our, and, and it, you know, that's roughly a few billion dollar instrument they built. So we think that the first answer is that this is a really cool thing. So, you know, working on it is, is, is you know, you may get nothing from a lot of people, you know, get that smelling for the good and all the luck that the universe conspired to let them observe this. The second question is really a, a philosophical one, again, that, uh, uh, you know, I grew up thinking that our solar system was poor, and uh, it is isn't uh, that uh, other star systems may be very interesting, they have life, maybe some of intelligent life. Uh, I used to get in trouble in high school because I, I had my textbook, and inside I had a science fiction book, I'm sure some of you did too. Uh, and, uh, Fortunately, they had a seated, seated in alphabetic order and Warden was always at the back, so I got away with it. Uh, but uh, this is really the next step in humanity's you know, quest to understand the universe uh, and go there. Uh, you know, the, there's a paper that's going to be coming out in a week or so that talks about a way to use this technology to actually stop a very small probe. So I think that will be released on the 1st of February. Uh, but, uh, it looks pretty incredible. So we're beginning to ignite that kind of research that I think will get us to, to you know, to figure out how to get to the nearest star, maybe put a spot in the So it's a start. If I, if I can just add to that, you know, that, that's one reason you have tenure. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm serious. So you get yeah. long term risk. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a student. It's obviously a student rather than a But there is a very interesting intermediate step that I want to. Uh, look at that a little bit. As you said before, uh, in a much more feasible, and all the tones are much less, you can do very useful research in what you call the boring uh, solar oh, yeah. system, which is not boring at all. But is it. No, I don't think it is either. I didn't do that. It, but, it's, but I said that a couple times. Yeah, you were the head of AIM, so you That's can right. say that. Uh, <laughs> in any case, um, is it feasible within 10 years to send any pro? In much less tolerance, like 50 kilometers a second, something small, there is huge potential for science. Pre precisely, precisely. And it's a, you know, we're looking at this prototype system, which we could probably have in 15 years, that could send, you know, things bigger than that star chip uh, at hundreds of kilometers. You probably just need a two meter laser diameter, like all the tolerances well, are much smaller, right? Well, you probably need tens of meters. But, and maybe 50 or 100 megawatts, but that's all doable, we think. Uh, the, the, the whole idea of using directed energy propulsion, I think, is it, the light sails were proposed in the early 60s by Robert Fulmer and others, but he did a lot of the work on them. Uh, this really gives us a new way to get things around the solar system. If you build this big array, you can send, you know, I can go through the numbers, you can send, you know, you know, many kilograms, of, you know, maybe even hundreds of kilometers, second, certainly tens. Uh, one of the interesting things that we need to do before we do an interstellar probe, we need to understand the mass distribution in the interstellar medium. Uh, the, 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 the mass spectrum that we're really worried about, there's about three orders of magnitude uncertainty uh, right now. On one end, you know, we can get there. The other end, it's very hard to do technology to imagine. So, uh, yes, I think that uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, one of the reasons that we want to make this a public-private partnership is we think space agencies around the world are very interested in, in the other missions that we can do as well. So, yes. And, in fact, one of the things we need to do, and uh, in due course we'll do this, is look at the other missions and sponsor some conferences. Is it utilizing so-called 10 years? To Pluto, and yeah. with this technology, we can explore the solar system within weeks. Yeah. That's exactly the point. So it's, it's pretty cool from that standpoint. So, even like I said, the boring solar system, well, if we find life somewhere in our solar system, that's I think that's the most important step. And it's, uh, we're not funding that, we think space agencies are funding it, but that's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's a really cool project, it would be really be wonderful for it to go through. But about the policy, 
you you were talking about that lasers are a hard thing for passing borders and that's it that you could not put it in space but still having it on the earth wherever it is it could be used to redirect asteroids yes but it could be used to well the orbit or incinerate any debris but also any working satellite meaning that will people let you have that laser and not exert some control in it i mean you would have control on any space program from anybody exactly this is a, a fundamental question and uh, uh, one of the things that we haven't really done much on but we will is some sort of global policy uh we think that uh, that this would be internationally controlled, uh, that there would be various countries that have kill switches so that, that you can't fire it. Uh, if it's on the ground, I mean, even if it's in Chile, it would have to have some sort of international regime. So these are things that, that give us a real opportunity, or, well, it's a challenge, but also an opportunity to begin to get the scientific community globally to think of how do we do something that's really important for humanity. Uh, obviously, there are other things like environmental issues, I hesitate to get into. Uh, but uh, but uh, you know this is a this is clearly a challenge, but it's an opportunity. Uh, it's interesting to me, you know, that it, you know, I, I've talked about these ideas with some you know other countries. The Chinese are very interested in it. Uh, the Russians are very interested in it. The India is very interested in it. A lot of European countries. Uh, Israel is interested in it. Uh, talk to some folks here. So it's, uh, I think that, that this is a real possibility, uh, particularly if it's in some place like Chile, which is, you know, fairly benign, and nobody's worried about the Chilean armed forces invading it. <laughs> All of the kids made in Bolivia, essentially. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, what we intend to, we probably launch one in one a day. The one that I didn't get into all the details, but, but having 50 gigawatts of prime time power, prime power is unlikely. So we want to store the power, we may use flywheels or batteries. And so you can fire it once a day. Uh, so we would probably fire one of these a day towards Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri. Hundreds over the course of years. We we looked at that, but the problem is that first of all, how do you you know how do you point at the you know you don't know exactly where the other one is. Uh, plus, you're likely to have a lot of them fail. Uh, so you know you, you when I was a kid, we used to have these holiday lights that, that never worked. They were in series, and, and I remember that, that, that it was my job as a 12 year old to go you know first of all you know screw each light out, then you had this, what if there were two broken, and, you know, they, uh, I remember my mother finally threw the lights out. <laughs> you know, after you replaced all of them, it still didn't work. So. I did see one of the high school students raise yeah. their hand, so. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, do you have uh, any plan to deaccelerate the chips to get them? Well, that's the, the you know, Next week, there will be a paper that will be published, I think it's in the Astrophysical Journal uh, Letters, uh, where I, I, I'm not at liberty to give away how they're going to do it. But yes, they have the ability to potentially stop a very small paper at, uh, at Dawson's Journal. So that's, that's an excellent question, because that's what you want to eventually stop. How can you take a picture if you're not stopped? We apply by. And yeah, well, you, we would probably we would we would rotate the thing so it's locked on. Now you're you've got obviously a significant as it's, approaching. as it's approaching or flying by. Even you know you end up getting some image smear, but the, you know that's what you, you know. If you, it's pretty you, significant if you're pointing to see. Yeah, well, we're probably going to be a few tenths of a a away, so it's you know it, it's still significant. But that those look like they're all doable by you know you time tag the photons. And, there's time delay integration kind of technologies or okay. there are no more questions. That's not key.